having too much fun. I'm so glad you've come home to Unity San Diego today. We're glad to have you here in person as well as watching us online. We have a wonderful guest, author, and speaker today, Mr. Greg Lavoie, who's going to help us explore listening for and responding to our callings. I think you're really going to want to look into this further, so I hope you'll plan to attend the a seminar he's leading today at noon. And now as we prepare for our gathering music, let us pray that our San Diego State Aztecs listen to their <laughs> callings, listen to their callings today, and win that game and move on to the final four. Yes. <laughs> and so it is. And I'm spirit. with you now, breath by breath, remembering who I am, opening to and, and listening for whatever is mine to do and to learn, to receive and to share today. Co-creating with you, I find balance and fulfillment in the process.
welcome here. You are 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 welcome here. Welcome, welcome to Unity San Diego. It's so great to have you all here with us today, online and here in the sanctuary. I know a few years ago, it was a few years ago, I heard our guest speaker at Unity at the Unity Worldwide Ministries Convention, and when he called and said he'd love to speak here, I'm like, yes, you guys are really going to enjoy this. So let's just take a moment just to begin today in prayer and the blessings that it's not raining. For a few, minutes, few minutes or a few days anyways. Let's just breathe into the loving spirit of God. That spirit that's flowing in as and through us, that's flowing in this blossoming of spring, this beautiful day, this time of new creations, of new life, of new love. And as we are here today to step into our callings, what are they? Do we have them? We will be spiritually uplifted and guided with the guidance of love, with the guidance of spirit, with the guidance of truth. And so we say thank you, thank you for this blessed Sunday through the power and the presence of the living Christ presence, and so it is. Amen. Let's move on to our affirmation, that positive statement that we say here at Unity San Diego that centers us. This is one of those days when I need to really center myself because, you know, it's been rainy and not rainy and on and off, and we all get that time when we need to just really center. So let's say this affirmation together, please. We manifest and express our spiritual oneness as we're guided by infinite wisdom and prospered by divine love. What better way can it be, by, be than to be guided by infinite wisdom along with that love that's moving in as and through us and through everything we do. And then we go to our vision, which is a big vision. We can all do it independently, as I always say, or as a group. So let's, as a group, say this now. 
Our vision is to transform lives and inspire people to make a positive difference in our world. And then we go to our mission, which is who we are here at, at Unity San Diego, where our focus is and how we do our part to spread unity to the world. Together, please. We empower personal growth through positive spiritual practices, inspirational music, and community service. And now if you'd like to stand, we will have some great inspirational music. When I walk. When I walk. Now Erin's yeah. going to sing it once through by herself, and then we're all going to join in so you can learn how the song goes. So one, two, three, four. Thank you. Stay standing because now we are going to greet each other online. Please type this simple greeting in the chat bar. I'm so blessed that you are here today. Let's say that to each other. I'm so blessed that you are here today. And actually think about it. Think about the blessings of being here with each other today. I am so blessed. I am so blessed that you are here today. All right. Doesn't it feel good to actually be here and be blessed? Because remember when we couldn't meet here and we were kind of blessed to be on seeing each other, maybe on Facebook or maybe on Zoom. But how blessed are we really to be here today? So thank you. Yeah. And I think it's time for Kathy to step up. You just sat down, right? <laughs> Sorry, it's time for announcements already. <clears throat> Excuse me. Well, we're grateful again that we are all here in person as well as watching online. And those of you who are watching us online, if you'd like to stay in closer touch, get more information, please email us here at unitysandiego at gmail.com. <coughs> Excuse me. 
Today we are welcoming our guest speaker, Greg Lavoie. I know you'll enjoy his lesson today as well as want to stay for his award-winning workshop, Callings in Search of an Authentic Life. The workshop is a $30 love offering and will start at noon. Since we really want you to stay for that workshop and, of course, enjoy some fellowship time in between, we'll be serving soup and salad after service today in Wrigley Hall on a love offering basis. So come and enjoy some vegetarian chili, some Greek lemon soup, or some vegetable beef soup and salad. On Good Friday, April the 7th, from noon to 3, we'll be holding a watch service here in the sanctuary. The seven last words of Jesus have long inspired people to find a deeper connection with God. So come and join Reverend Gretchen for all or part of this meditative service. And our Good Friday evening service is at 7 p.m. Please join us in our sanctuary as we combine with Unity of El Cajon for this meaningful meditative service combined with Holy Communion given by both Reverend Carla and Pastor Robert Bright. And our Easter service will be held on Sunday the 9th. It's so hard to believe it's already almost here at 10 o'clock. There will be wonderful special music, and Reverend Carla will speak about embracing the vision. There will be a special flowering of the cross ceremony for all to participate in. So bring a flower and prepare to be inspired by crossing out what no longer serves you and opening your spiritual awareness up to all of the blessings that are available to you. Our next small groups will begin the week of April the 23rd. We'll be studying the five principles by Ellen Devonport. We're looking for small group leaders who want to hold Zoom meetings or, be in, or have in-person meetings in their home. So for more information, please contact Reverend Carla at RevCarlaLeitner at gmail.com. And we're so glad that our annual ladies tea is back. And this year, our tea is entitled Celebrate Spring Renewal and will be held Saturday, April the 29th at 1.30. Tickets are $20 for adults and $10 for kids. And they were to go on sale today, but Cheryl Sabin, who is in charge and going to be in taking care of those tickets today, is actually sick. So I don't know if there's anyone else here on the committee uh, that would like to take over that duty today, but if it's possible, we'll be selling tickets today, and if not, you'll be able to get them next week. And then uh, lastly, but obviously very importantly, our prayer ministry here is available for you to call every day, Monday through Friday, from 12 to 5 p.m. So I guess I should say Monday through Friday rather than every day from 12 to 5. And their, time, their uh, number is posted on the screen, and it's at 282-7609. Silent Unity is available every day of the year from 3 a.m. to 11 p.m. our time at 816-969-2000. And we have prayer chaplains here if you would like some one-on-one -on -one personal prayer after the service today. Our chaplain is Linda Proctor, and she will meet with you over in St. Luke's Chapel. So just head right over there after service if you would like that one-on-one -on -one support. And uh, all of the prayer chaplains here hold us all in prayer, whether uh, they're here in person or not. So please know that. That's very important to all of us. So I invite you now to enjoy our meditation hymn, A Work of Heart. brilliant light for all to see perfect in every part heaven and earth in harmony the beauty of your face reveals a life of grace you are a work of art a masterpiece you are a work of art you are a work of art a brilliant for all to see, perfect in every part, heaven and earth in harmony, the beauty of your face reveals a life of grace, you are a work of art, a masterpiece, and I am a work of art. Perfect. 
Now is our time of meditation. I invite you to take a breath and just release. Become settled in your seat. Breathe in again and release. Knowing that we are in this safe and sacred space together as I invite you to silently allow the words that I speak to become the words of your heart. What is mine to do? What is my calling? Maybe I think I don't need a calling. I've lived my life. I'm done with that. I'm too old for this. But am I? Maybe I feel too young and I don't want to have a calling. Maybe I just want to flow. Am I? Or am I in this moment, this time, this time of meditation where I can release and ask the God of my understanding, what is mine to do? Because we are guided by infinite wisdom as long as we allow that wisdom to work through us. We are guided by divine love as long as we allow that divine love to work through us. We must open and receive and be in this moment. In this moment, I have a calling. It might not be what I did in high school or what I did in my 20s or 30s or 40s or 50s or beyond, but I have a calling right here, right now. My life is important. Being here, being this conduit for spirit, this divine child of God is important or I wouldn't be here. So I open up and allow, and I ask this question. What is my calling? What am I to do? Guide me, show me what is mine to do. As I take that question, what is mine to do, into the silence. As I listen to the words, to the sounds, to that sweet small voice, I realize that this is my prime. Today, today, I have a calling. I have a purpose. I am just as important today as I was any other day. And I am open and receptive to that guidance, to that calling, to be who I came here to be with love, with joy, with peace and harmony leading the way and say thank you, thank you, thank you, God. And so it is and so it shall truly be as I breathe into this amen moment and release. Breathe in again, release and open our eyes as we feel moved to do so knowing each and every day, every moment is sacred as we live in the present, that now. Thank you. Namaste.
now the Lord's Prayer. And Erin's going to take us to church on this. And uh, she's going to ask if she can get an amen. If you want to sing the amens with us, go ahead. I'm not sure that was the best choice for the Lord's Prayer because I'm going to sing a really soft song now. <laughs> Got you all wild up. Um, I, um, I thought I was coming up on my 20th year that I've been here, and I had, uh, I had somebody look into it, and actually, I've been here for 21 years. I know. It's a very long time. Longest job I've ever had in my entire life. Um, and the program has changed so much. When I, when I first got here, uh, we didn't do Gavi music. I would play a very soft and reverent hymn uh, for, a po for a prelude, and I'd do a hymn over in the organ. Uh, the choir would usually sing one song for special music. And then for offertory, I would just noodle on the piano until they walked back up, and that was it. And now, you know, like, you know we do a lot of music on every single Sunday. And uh, I'm very grateful for the music team for being with me and coming on this journey uh, for all this time. And... Uh, I know parents always say they don't have a favorite child. I can attest to that. My, I'm my favorite I'm from my mother's because I have three older brothers, and they will testify to that as well. And the reason I'm bringing this up is because <laughs> she knows this. Kathy Davis is probably my favorite person here of everybody here. <laughs> and everybody knows that, so it's not a surprise. And um, it's been uh, such a journey and a pleasure to watch her grow as a soloist over the past 20 years because I'm singing because of Ron. Because <laughs> she was a shy little thing that didn't sing. And uh, now she just had a drop of a hat. <laughs> and uh, so I appreciate it. And we're going to sing uh, um, a song by J.D. Martin and Jan Garrett, which they're two, two of our favorite people. And we love to sing their music. So thank you, Kathy, for singing the song with me. I've had it in my folder for more than 10 years. I've been waiting to sing this song with Cassie. So this is All That I Am. And I think of it as a love song. It's kind of a love song to ourselves and to those people who care about and support us, as well as to God. So, and to you, Ron. I sometimes don't know. to show me You hold the child inside the man I've longed to be And in my darkest night You're the light so I can see All that I am Is magic Created before time began Oh, how I love the way you love all I am. Ooh. Who am I to question all 
the gifts I've been given And now the part of me I didn't want to face Has become the very thing That gives me strength All that I am is magic Created before time began Oh, how I love the way you love all I am. What a wonderful thing to realize. I find myself looking in your eyes. All that I am is magic created before time began. Oh, how I love the way you love All I am is magic Created before time began Oh, how I love the way you love All I am You showed me how to love All that I am That was at that. Thanks. I had to step down here and watch you guys. That was magic. That was magic. Well, I am going to just step off the stage and now welcome up Greg Lavoy to talk about callings in search of an authentic life. Greg, All right. come on. Testing, testing. One, two, three. All right. Good morning. I'm delighted to be here in person. And uh, where shall I look to see the folks who might be zooming in? Up there. Got it. Good morning. I'm also delighted to have driven down here with my partner, Cindy, over the last couple of days to see the wildflowers, which are really just gorgeous this year. Just beautiful, all the rains. All right, so I think I'm going to jump right in. When I was in college, I learned a really valuable lesson about human nature and a little bit about what we're up against in trying to live into our true nature from a psychology class that I took. Um, in the middle of the semester, the students in this class pulled a prank on the professor. And it was based on what he was teaching us at that point. And it was called classical conditioning. All right? So if you know this concept, um, it's probably because of the famous experiment using Pavlov's dogs. Does that ring a bell? Very good. They were taught to salivate at the sound of a ringing bell. Um, and I discovered recently that Pavlov's dogs is also the name of a perfume, <laughs> which I think has very interesting implications, especially for the men folk. So this is what we did. We took advantage of the professor's habit of pacing back and forth in front of the lecture hall when he delivered his lectures. So whenever we paced over toward the windows, we very subtly pretended to be bored. OK, so he slouched and fidgeted and doodled and whatnot. And whenever he paced over toward the door, we now, again, very subtly, pretended to be interested. All right, so we sat up a little straighter, started taking notes, fixed him with keen scholarly expressions. By the time that day's class was over, we had our psychology professor glued to the door. <laughs> it was singularly the highlight of my college years. And I half expected that when the bell rang at the end of class, he would begin to visibly salivate. But he denied us that pleasure. But what I saw in that experiment 
was how incredibly easy it is to condition a human being, right? To steer them from the outside. Uh, and by extension, of course, to be conditioned. And without a word being spoken. Really, the entire experiment was essentially conducted in pantomime. And I figured that if it took us, what, 50 minutes to condition our psychology professor with a new set of behaviors, a new direction in life, if you will, um, I tried to imagine the effect on me of a lifetime's worth of that kind of conditioning um, by the time I was at that point 18. All right, the effect of thousands upon thousands of messages that each one of us got while we were growing up and that effectively instructed us in the rules of the game, right? What is and isn't possible, what dreams are and are not bankable, um, how you're supposed to behave in public, what the reigning definition of success is in our culture, what you personally are capable of. You know, you know who, who pulls the strings in this game and who dances, all right? And I think the cumulative effect of a lifetime's worth of that kind of messaging, um, spoken and unspoken, effectively forms a kind of hypnosis. It's really a kind of hypnosis. I don't even think it matters whether the messages you get are negative or positive. Right? It's a kind of hypnosis. And every kind of human community, families, um, the church, corporations, society at large, education, um, every kind of human community, I think, passes along the message that conformity is rewarded. And failure to conform is punished. Right? I think it's a holdover from natural law. Because what natural law tells us is that those who leave the herd to go their merry way have a tendency to get eaten. It's a little bit more complicated in the human arena, but I think the warning stands, right? And even though culture itself wouldn't exist without the glue of conformity, I just think that the individuals in it can sometimes tend to pay a pretty steep price for it. And one of the prices that we can pay is losing a working familiarity with who we really are, okay? So when I think of the notion of a calling, all right, um, I think a calling cuts through a lot of that conditioning because it emanates, I think, from the part of each one of us that knows what it knows, right? Knows what it knows. The part of us that knows where other people leave off and where we begin. And at a very early age, I've got a friend in San Francisco who told me once that she had a conversation with her five-year-old, Jenea, who apparently wanted to do something mommy didn't think advisable. So she says, uh, Jenea, honey, I, I wouldn't do that if I were you. To which Janea replied, with absolute certainty and innocence, but mommy, you're not me. Five years old, we knew where that line was, right? Calls emanate from the part of us that knows um, the feel of integrity in our lives and the feel of its absence. And I don't mean integrity as a moral issue. I mean it as a psychological issue, as in being in integrity with who we really are, right? Um, I think calls emanate from the part of us that knows at a really intuitive level what kinds of decisions it's going to take to um, you know, make your own life literally come true, okay? And I'm defining callings really broadly. All right, and frankly, secularly, all right? These are the, the signs, the signals, the urgings, the promptings, the messages, um, sometimes even the imperatives that come from deep inside your life that tell you what it's gonna to take to stay true to true north. If not true to uh, the developmental imperatives of your life, in other words, the fact that you change over time, 
and so frankly will the calls that come through the being that's being called. All right. So there's a, it's not just this one singular monolithic thing, a calling, at which some people may have learned in, say, Catholic school about there being one singular vocation per person per lifetime, and your job is to figure this out before the clock strikes 12. Okay. Um, so I'm defining it very broadly. And I also think that our lives are continually, uh, as Reverend Carla said in this beautiful meditation, um, our lives are continually calling on us to stay true to true north. You know, they're, they're to reinvent ourselves as we go along. What is my calling? What is mine to do now, today, here, right? Um, which may be very different than what you did in years past. And it's also calling us to remember, I think, that we each have a use by date. We just don't know what it is, you know? And I think we know this intuitively, that the older we get, the more the sense of urgency is turned up. Does that sound familiar? Sense of urgency on things is turned up, and the less and less postponement of our callings and our passions and our purposes becomes a viable option. I saw a bumper sticker years ago that said, warning, dates and calendar are closer than they appear. <laughs> All right, so uh, the kind of authenticity that I'm talking about when I um, talk about authenticity or the, the subtitle of the presentation today, and frankly, the book, um, is not, I think, even something people need to discover, right, or fill out a battery of vocational tests to figure out or go on a great pilgrimage to find out, as much as it's often something we need to remember. Remember, by the way means the exact same thing as religion. It means to rebond, to reconnect, all right, to our authentic nature, our true self, okay? So um, I think it's something that to some degree, perhaps we already know, or knew once and then forgot in the onslaught of all the messages that we get growing up, for instance, about who we're supposed to become. Something about remembering what we already know. When I was, when I was uh, researching the Callings book, uh, I ran across a college biology textbook that had a passage in there that described what happens in a fertilized human egg as it grows and develops. And what it said essentially is very early on in this growing process, these little indentations appear in the round cell ball that begin the process of distinguishing one side of you from the other, okay, the head from the hind quarters, and a distinction that seems to be lost entirely on some people, <laughs> even 40 years after they're fertilized. Um, nonetheless, what it said is that if at this point in the game, right, cell ball level, you were to take a cell from the head and mechanically move it down to the hindquarters, what would happen is that it would migrate right back up because, and this is what the book said, it knows what it's supposed to become. It knows what it's supposed to become. You imagine how this might strike you if you were researching a book about authenticity and integrity. We know what we're supposed to become. At a cellular level, that's how I read it. In fact, anymore, when I hear people use this kind of language to describe uh, their sense of intuition or callings, uh, I feel it in my gut. I feel it in my cells. I feel it in my bones. I feel it in the very fiber of my being. This kind of language. Anymore, I think maybe they're talking literally. Maybe they're talking literally. There was a guy that I included in the book. His name is Howard Ikemoto. He lives up in Santa Cruz. And he described an interaction he had with his seven-year-old daughter. Came to him one day and asked him, Daddy, what do you do at work? And he said, well, I work at the college, 
and my job is to teach people how to draw. And he said she looked back at him incredulous and said, Daddy, you mean they forget? I mean, imagine how that would strike a seven-year-old that you could possibly forget how to draw. It's like forgetting how to dream or something, you know. So as for how you go about remembering, remembering what you already know, um, let me share this. I did one of my callings weekend workshops at a conference center in Western Massachusetts years and years ago. And when I got to the front desk, I found out that there's another retreat also being conducted at that conference center, same weekend as mine. That one was on the subject of tracking, okay, animal tracking. And I was thrilled by this because it seemed to me that the two workshops being conducted at this conference center the same weekend were about the exact same subject, which was the search for signs. In their case, indicating the presence of animals. In our case, the presence of callings. Okay? So I talked to the people from that other workshop all weekend because we shared meals in the dining hall. And what jumped out at me about that bunch was how incredibly excited they were just about the signs of the animals. Not even the animals themselves. Frankly, they never saw the animals all weekend. Middle of winter, western Massachusetts. They never saw the animals, but I've never seen a group of grown-ups and professional people so excited and articulate about the subject of poop in my entire life. It's all they talked about all weekend, because it was one of their primary signs of calls. It's one of the few things they had to go by. But this was inspiring to me, and I shared it with the people in my workshop by saying, you know, if we could cultivate that quality of enthusiasm just for the hunt, just for the act of tracking our lives, paying attention to them, being in dialogue with them, I think they're going to reveal things to us they're not going to reveal if we're not interested. If we don't offer them some truly devoted curiosity, they're not going to give up their secrets. And animal tracks, I think are like signs of any kind. They lead to something. They point to something. You know, I don't know if you've ever heard of a book called The Tracker by a guy named Tom Brown. It's interesting to me that uh, this is a book ostensibly about animal tracking, but the bookstores often put it in the spiritual section. It's very interesting. And, um, and maybe this is one of the reasons why this is a quote that he had in there. And he says, an animal track is the end of a string. At the far end, a being is moving. A mystery that leaves itself like a trail of breadcrumbs. And by the time your mind has eaten its way to the maker of the tracks, the mystery is inside of you. And I love that as a description of the discernment process, the spiritual discernment process, right? So um, when I was, in fact, interviewing people for the book, one of the things that jumped out at me repeatedly in all the interviews that I did was how many of the people I interviewed about their relationship to their calls told me that they had a self-reflective practice of some kind in their life. And the whole point of it was to strike up a conversation with the maker of the tracks. Okay? Some kind of an ongoing dialogue with the deep self, or the higher self, if you will. Okay? And nothing extravagant. Daily journaling was really common. Meditation, for some people, therapy is a self-reflective practice. Counseling, um, I would say contemplative reading for some people is a practice. Dream interpretation was really common. Regular short retreats, regular intimate conversation. Your participation certainly in any kind of a group whose members get together for the primary purpose of waking up. Spiritual groups, mastermind groups, women's groups, men's groups, 12-step groups, you know, any kind of a group. So people were telling me that they had some kind of a practice. And when you turn on 
this, these receivers, right? When you put out your antenna and really make it a regular practice of listening in, you begin to discover um, that there's, for one thing, there's not just one calling in there. All right, not just one call, there's multitudes of them. And in lots of different arenas, yes, there are vocational calls. That's what most people think of when they think of callings. But there's also relationship calls and lifestyle calls, moral calls, spiritual calls. The ones you got when you were 20, assuming you got one, really different, aren't they, than the ones you get at 50? different than the ones you're going to get at 75, right? There's that developmental piece, again, to callings. They track our lives, all right? So, um, and I think that you can spend so much time waiting and waiting and waiting for the great big calling. I see this a lot in my line of work, you know, the vocational burning bush that you miss all the smaller calls that are right at your feet. They're, they're kind of like the fire drills for the bigger ones, right? The poet by the name of Wallace Stevens once said, oh, I don't ask for the full ringing of the bell. I don't ask for a clap of thunder. A scrawny cry will do. And I love that. I love that approach to discerning calls because they come in a Im very impressive variety of forms. And it sort of pays to post sentries at the various gates to get them when they come through. Because calls come as passions, even just momentary passions, not the great big capital P passions. They come as gifts. They come as intuitions. I think an intuition is almost clinically a little calling, right? They come as dreams. During my research, I discovered every religion in the world seems to agree that dreams are one of the primary channels through which God speaks to the mortals, okay? Um, novelist by the name of Tom Robbins. I don't know if anybody remembers Tom Robbins. He said, dreams don't come true. They are true. When we talk about our dreams coming true, he said, we're talking about our ambitions. That's a very different story. And there was a really interesting corroboration, I thought, for that idea that came out of Johns Hopkins University about 15 years ago. They studied pregnant women, and they found that of the women who had an intuition about the gender of their baby, they were correct 71% of the time, which I thought was impressive all by itself. Of the women who had a dream about the gender of their baby, they were correct 100% of the time. So Johns Hopkins study, 100% of the time. What does that say? I mean, we've got access to very deep knowledge in there, and we're sleeping through it most of the time, right? Callings come as, and, and this, is the le this is the level at which I encourage people to consider this stuff, and will, in fact, in the workshop this afternoon. Callings come through things like song lyrics you can't get out of your head for a week, right? Um, anybody ever heard of a novelist named Ann Tyler? She wrote, if you know of her work at, at all, it's probably because one of her books called The Accidental Tourist, was made into a movie with William Hurt, okay? But she's a brilliant observer of the dynamics between partners. She says, I can always tell what my husband is really thinking by the tunes that he absentmindedly hums in the car. <laughs> so gentlemen, take note. Um, and the first time I noticed this myself was I was about to quit my job as a reporter. It's my professional background. Um, one, of, one of the newspapers I worked, I was about to quit out of just sheer frustration. And um, for a week, right around that period of time, I kept hearing one line from The Wizard of Oz, day and night, if I only had a brain. <laughs> just that, that one little sentence fragment. And it suddenly, I realized, oh, 
I'm not thinking this through. And I, and I prevented myself from leaping, right? But that's a call. Song lyric you can't get out of your head for weeks. Just like that, all right? And some others. Callings come through things like a conversation you overhear in a restaurant that almost seems like it's addressing something you're dealing with, right? Or a decision that needs to be made in your life now, not backburnered another year. You know what I'm saying? Some issue that's hanging over your head right now in your life, waiting for resolution. That's a calling, I think. Right? If, uh, calls come through, where is there friction in your life right now? Where's there friction? Because it's like in the natural world. Friction occurs where changes are trying to take place or are taking place. So where does your head constantly argue with your heart about something? All right, where does uh, passion kind of rub up against security? It's one of the primary dynamics, I think, in people's relationship to their calls. Passion, security, okay? Where is their friction there? Where does walk not exactly match talk? Where do you fight with people? What are you fighting for? Right? Things like this. So where there's friction in your life is one place. Where there's patterns that have established themselves in your life by this point in time. Certain patterns, like you've, you've worn a footpath to and from and to and from some issue, lesson you've endlessly had to learn, right? Or the kind of mistake you continually find yourself making kind of partner you continually attract, getting fired again. Even the section of the bookstore you always walk into first when you walk into a bookstore. There's certain patterns that may be, me Ooh, sorry, that may be meaningful and may be callings, all right? And they, they definitely come through the body. I have an entire chapter in the callings book called The Language of the Body because the word symptom means a sign. That's what the word means. A sign of what? Right? The word pathology means the logic of pain. What's the logic? Even if it's psychologic. All right? And there was a guy that I interviewed for that chapter. Uh, his name is Arnold Mindell. He started something called process-oriented psychology, and he's a brilliant body-mind guy. He said, during that interview, he said, symptoms are usually dreams trying to come true. I'd never heard that before. Symptoms are dreams trying to come true? And the more I thought about it, the more I realized this actually mirrors a belief I have and have had for a long time, which is that talents and gifts, especially the big ones, Talents and gifts become needs. That is to be expressed. They become needs. And if those needs are not met somewhere along the road, they're going to turn into symptoms. Could be emotional symptoms like frustration or um, anxiety, of time, you know, time rushing down the hourglass. Could be envy at other people's success, feeling out of whack with yourself. Or it could be, of course, physical symptoms of any stripe. Okay, so two weeks after that interview and Arnold Mindell telling me that thing about dreams, I got it. I, re I got it in a visceral way because I went to present at a writer's conference in Albuquerque. And after my presentation, I'm out in the lobby chatting with people. And this woman walks up to me out of the crowd, and a complete stranger walks up to me and says, um, one of those things that people won't typically say to you unless they're pretty sure they're never going to see you again. <laughs> she said, hey, you, you know why I'm so fat? Which is not a question you're supposed to answer. And before I could really even just gather my wits, she answered it. She says, it's because I have so many stories inside of me that I'm not writing down. And I thought of Arnie Mandel. 
Oh, look at that. Look at that symptom as dream trying to come through. You know, there is no science or philosophy I know of that could dispute a self-diagnosis delivered with that kind of certainty. You know what I mean? The woman knew her body was trying to tell her something. She apparently knew exactly what it was. I need to be writing, you know? And, and she says, this is, this is how she described it. This is a call that is pushing out from inside of me. So I'm fascinated now by the callings that come through the body. Just fascinated by that. So um, one or two more things. All of these signs and all of these signals are really useful unless they can't get through. OK? And calls have a tough time getting through when they get nothing but busy signals. You know, when we're constantly tying up the lines with busyness as usual. OK? So I just want to share this because I'm aware that I'm, I'm, I'm addressing a modern, sophisticated, technologically advanced civilization here today. And I just want to share this. I read this story in um, The New Yorker some years ago. It was a story written by a guy named Adam Gopnik. And he is talking about his three-year-old daughter who has an imaginary playmate by the name of Charlie Ravioli. And that's what you would Google if you want to read the story. It's quite a commentary on the culture we've created. So what he's saying is there's nothing unusual about a three-year-old having an imaginary playmate except this one is always too busy to play with her. She's calling up Charlie Ravioli on her toy cell phone and always having to leave him messages. How pathetic is this? And a month later, her father discovers she's now leaving messages with somebody named Lori. He says, sweetheart, who's Lori? And in her three-year-old fashion, she explains that this is Charlie Ravioli's assistant. This is somebody he's apparently hired to return his phone calls for him. Now, maybe I'm being overly sensitive or something, but when our three-year-old's imaginary playmates are too busy to play with them and start hiring assistants to fend off the insistent phone calls of the children who imagine them to begin with, I'm just thinking it's time to move out of New York. Or, or rearrange your priorities or something, something. Because the compulsion toward busyness is a pretty good definition of workaholism, right? One of our very, very few socially sanctioned addictions, experts just call it a process addiction instead of a substance addiction, okay? Unless you consider adrenaline a substance, I suppose. You know, and it's one of the very few addictions you can put on your resume. You know, you can't do that with most addictions. Okay? So I, I just, I'm sharing this because even if all of our works are good works, even if all of our busyness is in the service of worthy and, and noble causes and callings, when the means to those ends is an addictive process, I think the end result is a loss of soul. I think it's a depletion of spirit. All right. So um, lastly, I'm going to wind up with this. I think that when we are willing to insist on our own vitality, our own integrity, which is something that calling specializes in leading us toward, or sometimes pushing us toward, OK? Um, I think what we do is we stake a claim for everybody's. Everybody's. And I say this partly because callings are, by definition, community property. Yes, you alone are called, but you're not the only one affected by how you choose to respond. If you're a part of a partnership, you know this by heart. That if you are called to change your job description or retire or move out of town, 
your partner is going to be affected. Your women's group is going to be affected. Your community at church is going to be affected. Your employees are going to be affected. All right? So it matters how we individually respond and how that uh, speaks to the whole community. A perfect example, of course, would be the story of Jonah, who I frankly think of as the patron saint of refused callings. You know, he gets a call, he wants no part of it, he books himself passage on a ship heading in the exact geographically opposite direction, and then he goes to sleep in the bottom of the boat. This is a state that psychologists today tend to refer to as denial. Um, and God is not amused or fooled and sends a storm down on the ship, meaning that all of his crewmates are in danger of their lives because of his refusal of a calling. So it's a, it's a rather dramatic story showing the power of community and the role that it plays in individual callings. So there is a reason that some of the world's great stories, um, I'm thinking of Sleeping Beauty, I'm thinking of King Arthur, and there are versions, by the way, of those stories all, in cultures all around the world. There's a reason they speak to the idea that when the king sleeps, as in King Arthur, those around him also sleep, and the kingdom goes to sleep. All right? When the queen sleeps, as in Sleeping Beauty, you might remember the story, those around her also sleep, and the whole kingdom goes dormant. But when the king and the queen awaken in these stories, those around them also awaken, and the kingdom starts to flower. All right? This idea is embedded really deeply into the philosophies, mythologies, religions of the world. It's what they refer to as an archetypal truth, meaning age-old, continually recurring truth. And I think what it's telling us, the, these stories are telling us is, when we awaken, we help the kingdom to awaken. The small steps actually are the big picture. Right? Our individual work is the work of the world. I saw a bumper sticker years ago that said, maybe the hokey pokey is what it's all about. <laughs> so I think there's some truth to that. So I just want to um, say that in the, um, in the spirit of helping the kingdom to awaken, if I may, um, as well as our individual lives, I just want to say that the workshop this afternoon is a very hands-on opportunity to simply explore what your own life is calling for from you at this juncture, right? An answer to the question, what wants to emerge at this juncture? What wants to happen? So I hope you'll come, and uh, thank you very much for inviting me. Thank you so much. Thank you. Well, let's stand and sing something, everybody. This is called We Are the Ones that we've been waiting for as I wait for everybody to get up. And as we're waiting for that, I just want to thank uh, Robert, who's been subbing for PJ for like almost the past two months. This is his last Sunday, so thank you, Robert, it's for his birthday too. being and his birthday. Well, let's sing. Okay, with that in mind, let's sing We Are The Ones. Here we go. Two, three, and. Here we go. We are the ones that we've been waiting for. We are the ones, we are the ones that we've been waiting for. We are the ones, we are the ones that we've been waiting for. We are the ones, we are the ones that we've been waiting for. We are the ones, we are the ones that we've been waiting for. We are the mothers who breathe with Mother Earth. We are the fathers blessed with a gentle strength. The sisters and brothers respected hand in hand. The sons and the daughters who walk upon the sacred land. And we are the ones, we are the ones that we been waiting for. We are the ones, we are the ones that we've been waiting for. We are 
are the ones, we are the ones that we've been waiting for. We are the ones, we are the ones that we've been waiting for. We are the healers who hear the voice of truth. We are the elders who wisdom guides our youth. The searchers and seekers with wings spread to the sun. Shapers and builders who work a peace is never done. We are the ones, we are the ones that we've been waiting for. We are the ones, we are the ones that we've been waiting for. We are the ones, we are the ones that we've been waiting for. We are the ones, we are the ones that we've been waiting for. We are the givers, mercy, believers in grace, singers of great beauty, and keepers of the faith. We are the sailors who come back through the storm. We are the dreamers resting in God's grim arms. The dancers and lovers who move beneath the stars. The masters and teachers who visions remind us who we are. We are the ones, we are the ones that we've been waiting for. We are the ones, we are the ones that we've been waiting for. We are the ones, we are the ones that we've been waiting for. We are the ones, we are the ones that we've been waiting You just have to hang on to it for a second. Okay. And then it takes a second. Then it takes a second. You'll see a little light on the on the side when it's on. It's on. I can hear it. Okay. Yes, 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 yes. Okay. I am here because Reverend Carla is multitasking. Um, she's cooking soup for us. So be sure and go and have some. And I want to thank Greg again. That was fascinating, that was wonderful, and I look forward to the workshop. I will be speaking next Sunday, Palm Sunday, and I think all the music is entitled Hosanna. Right? A whole bunch of Hosanna's coming up. <laughs> so now is our time of giving and receiving. So I invite you, if you are watching on live stream, to click the donate button. And for those of us here together in the sanctuary, please take your offering in your hands and we'll say our offering blessing together. Whoops, going the wrong way. Maybe it's not there. Well, we know it. Um, so it's divine love flowing through me, blesses and multiplies all that I have, all that I give, and all that I receive. I am richly blessed, creating a greater and greater flow. So let's say that twice aloud and once in the silence. Together, divine love flowing through me, blesses and multiplies all that I have, all that I give, and all that I receive. I am richly blessed creating a greater and greater flow. And again, divine love flowing through me blesses and multiplies all that I have, all that I give, and all that I receive. I am richly blessed, creating a greater and greater flow. And once again, in the silence. And precious spirit, we are indeed richly blessed. And as we recognize this, as we live this fact, we are conduits for a greater and greater flow. And we are fearless knowing that our prosperity is assured. And we say, thank you. Thank you, God. Amen. And now the music team is going to sing Call to Be. Uh, yeah, this song is one, well, 
Faith Rivera is one of my favorite singer-songwriters, and I loved the idea that was expressed during the lesson that we have multiple little callings throughout our lives, and sometimes in one day. And uh, rather than looking for the big calling, this song really epitomizes all of those little callings that we are called on to be. This is called to be. Two, three. I am called to be a healer for all humanity. I am called to be a dreamer, believe in what can be. I am called to be a maker, be an instrument of peace. I am called to be a giver of abundance I receive. I am called to be a prayer, living out the truth I seek. I am called to be everything. I am called to be, called to be the glory here on earth for all to see, all the love and all the beauty that shines in you and me, you who hold the living, breathing God, and you are one with me, we're called to be. You are called to be a mother, to nurture family. Yeah. You are called to be a brother, brother, be strength in times of need. You are called to be a neighbor, neighbor. see a friend in all you meet. You are called to be a leader, leader. to build community. You are called to be a prayer, living out the truth you see. You are called to be everything. You are called to be. Called to be. called to be the uh, I'm sorry we are called to be the kindness set the broken hearted free we are called to be forgiveness where pain has run too deep we are called to be compassion be the wind beneath each wing we are called to make communion only then can we succeed. We are called to be a prayer, living out the truth you see. We are called to be everything. We are called to be. Shines in you and me, you are the living, breathing God, and you are one in me. We're called to be, called to be peace, called to be joy, called to be love. We're called to be, called to be peace, called to be joy, called to be free. We're called to be, called to be peace, called to be joy, called to be love. Now, Linda has our 
prayer box, and we're going to bless the offering and the prayer box. We thank you, God, for the offerings given in love and trust and faith, knowing that you are our one and only source. Mm -hmm. There is nothing to fear. We are conduits of your love and your blessings, and we say thank you, thank you, God. And we bless the prayers in this box and the prayers that are still in the hearts of every one of us. We pray for all who are ill, those who are experiencing fear. We pray for the people in the Ukraine and other places, hot spots on the globe, people that are suffering from earthquakes, other natural disasters. There's no end of people that need our prayers, and we open our hearts to them, and we lift them up, and we say, thank you, God, for your blessings. Amen. Thank you. And now, Linda is our prayer chaplain. She will be in St. Luke's Chapel to pray with you after the service. And now, please rise, and we will sing more than enough. <laughs> There is more than enough in the universe that you created. There is more than enough on a planet of sacred design. There is more than enough for humanity made in your image. Why would I worry? Why would I doubt? surrounds us, the love of God enfolds us, the power of God protects us, the presence of God watches over us. Wherever we are, God is, and we are open and receptive to our callings. Amen. See you at the workshop.
Good week, everybody.